The Carnegie Mellon Vaccination Database Talks are made possible by Ottitune. Learn how to automatically optimise your MySQL and Postgres configurations at ottitune.com. And by the Stephen Moy Foundation for keeping it real. Find out how best to keep it real at stephenmoyfoundation.org. I'm excited today to have Stephen Wakanas. He is the Director of Engineering at Vertica. Um, it's, it's been there for a long time. Um, certainly in the early days before they were acquired by HP and then obviously when they were moved on to Microfocus. So as always, if you have any questions for Stephen, please unmute yourself, uh, say who you are and ask your question uh, directly at him. And feel free to do this anytime and, and interrupt him because that way you want, you want him to feel like he's actually giving a talk in front of people and not to his laptop and Zoom for an hour. So Stephen, with that, thank you for being here. The floor is yours. All right. Thank you very much, Andy. And yes, please do do interrupt and ask questions. I want to um, deliver the information as clearly as possible, and it'll it'll help to clarify for yourself and for others if you interrupt me and and ask me questions. Um, I titled this talk "High Performance Over Varying Terrain." Uh, you could look at the varying terrain in two different ways. One is that Vertica has customers who are deploying our system on very different scales. We have some that are running single node Vertica instances on a couple of terabytes of data. We have customers like the Trade Desk who are running in the cloud uh, and they have uh, replicated databases, one on the East Coast, one on the West Coast. Each of those databases is over 600 nodes and 12 petabytes of data. So even within a single version release of Vertica, there's quite a variance in the way that the product is deployed. Um, the other way you could look at the varying terrain is that Vertica was uh, the inception of, of, of Vertica. The C-Store paper was published in 2005. And obviously over the time since then to now, there have been substantial changes in hardware and the way that the database is deployed. Um, I chose these images carefully. Uh, the one on the left, the, the Jaguar is their Formula E race car. Jaguar is a partner of Vertica. They're using our database to do analytics on uh, data that they're collecting, metrics that they're collecting during the race, uh, including weather, uh, a bunch of metrics about the car and the performance. And then they're using that both to uh, provide optimizations during the race and also to do comparisons after the race and figure out how they can race better. Um, if you didn't see, the vertical logo and the first time I added this obnoxious red arrow to make it clear. So that's on the, the actual Formula E race car now, the vertical logo but and the you, partnership. You guys pay them for this or, 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 or it's a partnership? It's a partnership. So they're using our product and doing analytics on racing data and they wanted to recognize us uh, as, as part of that partnership. So. Um, they actually uh, approached us about putting the logo on their Formula E car. And of course, you know, we thought it was awesome to, to have it appear there. So a little bit about what is Vertica. Um, I'm sure many of you have, have, have already heard C-Store Vertica uh, distributed SQL analytics database. Um, what's it mean to be a, an analytics database? So we're answering questions that require doing computation over oftentimes billions of rows. So a simple example might be, you know, show me the stock ticker symbols that are most frequently traded over the past month. Uh, this uh, Vertica was commercialized from the C-Store paper that was written by Mike Stonebreaker and many others. Um, at the time that I was interviewing at Vertica, uh, Mike had already moved on, become bored with OLAP and he moved on to OLTP. Um, and it was actually the OLTP group, the uh, VoltDB folks, um, which if, if you're not aware, Volt stands for Vertica Online Transaction Processing Database. Uh, it was actually those folks that I first interviewed with. And I missed an opportunity to work with Andrew Pavlo. <laughs> um, uh, you know, one of my great career regrets. Uh, fortunately, I, I, I joined an outstanding team um, at Vertica and it's been an awesome experience for the past 13 years. I started as an individual contributor um, and I've worked up through being a manager, opening an office in Pittsburgh and now I'm director of engineering at Vertica. Uh, all of you know that enormous amounts of data are produced every minute. Uh, this is from 2019. One thing that I found interesting here is that 
the number of emails sent is 10 times the number of text messages that have been sent or received. Um, another thing that's interesting to think about is that though the way this data is collected may have changed dramatically over the years, uh, you know, you think about emails and text messages and so forth, they don't need to be stored in transaction processing systems because they're not updated. You know, something like a log structured merge tree will do just fine uh, as long as it has some reliability guarantees applied to it. Um, though there was a uh, movement away from consistent analytic systems to eventual consistency, there's been a, a large migration back to systems that have guarantees around consistency because they're much easier to reason about. And as long as they can scale to handle the magnitude of the problem, then uh, it's, easy, it's better to have consistent results than have to worry about uh, ones that will eventually be consistent. Vertica is heavily used in a number of different verticals, fintech, ad tech, and so forth. Um, one of my favorite examples is in the healthcare space. Cerner has developed um, a system that they call health facts that they use to detect early onset of sepsis. Uh, sepsis is a bacterial infection um, that when detected early, it is relatively easy to treat with antibiotics. Uh, however, when it progresses to some to later stages, it becomes very difficult and expensive to treat with long hospital stays and a 50% mortality rate. And so uh, it's been really neat to see and work with the crew at Cerner um, and the advancements that they've made on early detection of sepsis and the millions of lives that they've been able to save because of that. In general, Vertica's customers value performance and flexibility. It's been performance since day one when Vertica was outperforming row stores by several orders of magnitude. Um, in today's marketplace, uh, where you have options to deploy on the cloud, on premise, and private cloud, on Kubernetes, and so forth, you know, Vertica supports all of those options uh, as a software uh, only product now, also with our Vertica Accelerator, which is our, our as-a-service offering for Vertica. And so we have a breadth of flexibility for our customers to be able to deploy the product. And we have some customers who are deploying both on-premise, replicating into the cloud where they can handle bursty workloads, um, you know, especially for those who are in e-commerce and see a big rush during the holiday. All right, so that's more of the, you know, what Vertica is and where it's positioned in the marketplace. Um, if you've read the C-Store paper, then these five pillars are gonna be very familiar to you. Uh, Vertica stores its data in projections. And when one of the important attributes of projections is that you can specify the sort order. So if you're storing stock trades, for example, you can specify that you're gonna order the entries first by symbol and then perhaps by date or other attributes of the table. Uh, one misconception that I find people have about projections is that they think each of the columns is sorted independently. Uh, when we're sorting rows of data, say you're doing an insert into a Vertica database, then the sort key specifies the order in which we're going to sort those rows. Each column of the row is gonna appear in the same ordinal position as the other columns, right? So we're, we're sorting by a key, but it's the entire row that's positioned in the projection. Projections are sometimes confused with indices. They do some things that are very similar. Um, improving the performance, the optimizer can use the sort order of a projection to say, you know, efficiently uh, apply a predicate. Uh, significant difference between projections and indices is that projections are stored in sort of a log structured merge tree. And so they can be created uh, at, at the same time that data is being queried. There's no need to turn off the indexing that happens with projections um, as there was with databases that support uh, indexes. The other significant difference is that when you've done the binary search to find the range of values that match your predicate, when within an index, you would then have positions that you would go and you would look up to find the actual values corresponding to that range that you had found in the index. And those 
positions require seeks on disk, which can be quite expensive. Whereas with projections, you have the entire table sorted by the same order. And so when you go and look for the range of values that match that predicate, you're then doing scans over all the other compressions, all the other columns, I'm sorry. Um, when storing data oriented in columns, the entropy going down the column tends to be much less than the entropy going across a row. And so we get compression levels that on average are 10x above the raw data size, um, oftentimes significantly greater than that, especially for those columns that appear in the sort order. We can also do RLE encoding of the data. So if you have stock symbols and you're ordering by those symbols, there are only a few thousand symbols. There are billions of trades. We get uh, a sort column that has only a few thousand entries. And then the run length encoding uh, tells you how many recurrences of those entries appear in that in that run. The data is columnar, which has been a significant advantage from the beginning. But now, these days, it's more so than even in the early days of Vertica. Uh, with columns, you can do joins before loading the data into the, the database and avoid doing those more costly joins at query time. Uh, so we see a lot of customers who are denormalizing their, their data um, gaming companies, for example, when they have a new game, they'll add a new column to the database for the games that don't use that attribute. Uh, they're storing null values. Those null values compress very well. There's, there's very little cost to adding columns that are infrequently used or that are sparse to a column or database. Uh, the evidence that we've seen in our product is that we went from supporting 1,600 columns as the maximum limit to now supporting 10,000 columns in the database based on the requests that we've had from customers. Another attribute of a projection why, is that you can specify. Sorry, why 10,000? That seems like an odd number. Like, why not do it, the 16 or whatever? Like, Well, yes, you often find in the code base places where we've rounded down based on it being, you know, that it's easier to an easier number to provide to customers than a two to oh. the something value, right? But I mean, you could tell them it was 10,000 versus two to, two to the whatever, right? Yes, and it's actually, it's a knob that controls this. So we, we okay. set the upper bound at a, at a particular limit and it uh, really is workload dependent, but that was a safe limit that um, you know, we felt comfortable with. But it will depend on it will depend on the, the the types of columns themselves. If you have very wide uh, var binary or var car, then you're going to get fewer than than those. At least you know for a performance that's acceptable. I, I was thinking like Oracle. Oracle famously has a thousand because it's 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 hard coded in the code. It's hard coded in their source code. And it's all over the place. And like they told me to, to they already changed it once, and it's such a hard big pain to change it again would be. A major undertaking. Nobody wants to do it. It's sort of like ah, so, it, so. When we bump the limit up, we we put it behind a knob so that we wouldn't yeah. have that problem going yeah. forward. Yes. So okay. if you know okay. if you know which knob to turn, you can turn it up above ten thousand. Um, and as I said, you know, depending on the types of the columns, if they're all integers, you can certainly turn it up without running out of resources, especially on these you know one terabyte memory machines that people, uh, you know, big beefy machines that people have these days. But you have to pick a, a number as the default, and 10,000 was, was what was chosen. Okay. Sure. All right, another attribute of, of projections is that you can specify the segmentation. Uh, Vertic is very careful about the way we place the, each of the rows within a cluster of nodes. Um, we do this so that we can apply optimizations like co-segmented group buys and co-segmented joins. So if you've segmented a projection on keys that you're going to use in the group by, then we can we, 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 we can apply that group by without having to redistribute the data among each of the nodes in the database, similarly with a co-segment to join. Um, I don't know if we'll have time to get to that part of the presentation, um, but if we, if we do, we'll talk about how elasticity um, is impacted by that choice of, of careful placement of the data. All 
All right, drilling in on projections in a little more detail. So using this trades example, if we decided to sort by symbol and secondarily by date, uh, the, the trades table might have many other columns like the bid and the ask price, the quantity that was traded, the broker that made the trade. Um, you know, it, it's common that if you're storing data in an analytic database, you wanna store everything just in case you later find out that something is use, some bit of information is useful. As I said, each column of a particular row is stored in the same position. And so that means that when we search the symbol column, we can do a binary search on that since it's first in the sort order, that then any of the other columns would appear within the range that we find, you know, in this case for the Apple ticker symbol. Um, for the query that I've included in the bottom left there, where we're selecting the minimum date of any trades made on this Apple symbol, uh, because the date is second in the sort order, this is a matter of simply finding the first block within the positional index, which I'll talk about in just a second. And we don't need to scan beyond that because we know that the dates are sorted um, and that the first one's gonna contain the minimum, right? Once we've put a constant value on the symbol. So drilling into the structure of the content as it's stored in the database, each column, at least logically, is stored in two separate files. There's what we call a positional index or the PIDX file. And that contains the min and the max value as well as a null count and a CRC so that we can check for file corruption in the FDB file. Um, an offset into the FDB file, the uncompressed size of the block that's stored within there, and the compressed size as well. Uh, the FDB file is the file that contains the actual data. It's been encoded and compressed, though I've shown it here in plain text. Uh, obviously, as, as stored on disk, it would um, not be human readable. Though, if you could guess the encoding or if you had the catalog and could look it up, then you could be you could uh, unencode it, uncompress it, and read the data. Uh, so it's it's not encrypted, um, at least you know not without a, uh, additional functionality being applied to it. Um, for integers, we take a block of 64k, a, a buffer of that size that's already been encoded. We run compression, um, might be LZO or uh, a, a delta. Um, in compression on it. And then we store that data compressed in the block. So what's happening when we're doing a search for a range of values within a PIDX file, we can do a binary search because we've ordered by that column. Uh, when we find the range of values, then that's pointers into the FDB file where we can find the compressed blocks. Um, and then we can uncompress and jump to the ordinal position within that block to find the corresponding column entry or cell entry. Uh, what There's a trade-off, obviously, between the size of the block that we're compressing. Um, bigger, we would get better compression, but too big, and we end up reading a lot of values, uncompressing a lot of values that aren't going to contribute to the calculation that we're making in the query. So there's uh, a trade-off between um, too big and wasteful uh, uncompression and too small and don't get good compression on the data. So looking at a relatively simple plan to load data into a Vertica database, uh, if you've read the C-Store paper, it makes mention of something called a buddy projection. This is a replica of the projection that can be used for what's called in the uh, C store paper case safety. So for case safety of one, you need at least one replica. That way you can lose at any node in the database and continue running. And in fact, as long as you lose, you can lose more nodes than just, just that one, as long as you don't lose any two buddy projections, right? So you can still have a consistent collection of the data. Um, in the C store paper, it talks about each of these buddy projections being able to have a different sort order than one another. 
Uh, so the benefit of doing that would be that the optimizer can choose the projection that's best suited for the for the particular query. So in the previous example where I was using symbol as the predicate, uh, if there were a projection sorted by symbol, the optimizer would choose it. Um, if I if I then queried and used timestamp as the predicate, then the database would look for a projection that had uh, the order the the column, the primary sort order as the timestamp, and use that for 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 the query results. Um, so what's going on here is if you read from the bottom up, the load is the thing that's parsing the tuples and turning uh, parsing the limited file or parquet or orc and turning them into tuples. They then get copied and sent to this resegment send. The resegment send is then going to look at the segmentation key of each of those tuples and determine which node to send it onto. It gets received by that node. And then the data target, the thing at the top, is what's doing the sorting, encoding, compressing, and writing out those PIDX and FDB files. Right. So in this plan, the copy is being done to the in-memory representation of the tuples. And then those tuples are being sent over the network to the primary and to the buddy node. It wasn't long in Vertica's history that till we discovered that having buddy projections with different sort orders is a bad idea. Does anyone want to wager a guess as to why that is? So if you think harder. about, sorry. It makes recovery harder? It makes recovery really, really difficult. If you have terabytes of data that are stored in, say, your largest fact table on each of the nodes, then that those terabytes of data have to be resorted in order for the node to recover. And that's a relatively expensive operation to run. In some instances for our customers, it was taking them many days to recover. And DBAs are usually, their heart rate is elevated whenever recovery is going on. Um, you know, they're worried about that, that replica copy uh, going down and losing the database um, or having to go back to a backup to recover it. So it turned out that having buddy projections with different sort orders for a large scale database was not a good idea. Um, so we were quick to address that and change the original plan so that, uh, well, we actually just put the requirement on the projections that you couldn't create a buddy with a different sort order. That was easy to do, relatively easy to do. Um, but then with the previous plan where we're making copies of the tuples and resegmenting them to each of the nodes, uh, there's an inefficiency because the copy of the tuple is significantly larger than the compressed and encoded ROS format in the PIDX and the FDB files. And so we rewrote some of the code and redesigned the load process so that the records were fed to a single data target for that segment of the data that was being written. And then once the ROS file was created, the uh, PIDX and the FDB files were then streamed, pipelined over to what we called a data target proxy. So that data target proxy was a pretty simple operator that was just receiving the storage format and persisting it to disk on the buddy node. So that's a high level explanation of what's going on when data is loaded into Vertica database. Digging a little deeper into the data target itself, you can see that there are multiple threads that are working on queues to do the sort in parallel. Um, so we might be loading massive amounts of data into the database. We want to make use of all the processing power that we have in order to do a sort. Um, the sort might have to be done in multiple merge phases. So if we've loaded large enough amounts of data, we load it into a large buffer. We do something like a quick sort in memory. We compress that data. We write it out as a chunk. And then if we've done that with very many chunks of data, we might have to make multiple passes in order to do the merge efficiently. If you tried to do the merge all in one pass, you wouldn't have enough 
resources to be able to keep the data buffered and you do a bunch of disk seeks every time you're trying to access the next record in the compressed chunk of sorted file and that would be very expensive more expensive than doing it in multiple passes right once we've done those multiple passes over the uh, the sorted chunks then we're writing it into the pidx and fdb files and then streaming those over to data target proxy as that is, as those are being written um, today when we're writing to our persistent storage it's shared storage it's s3 or hdfs or google storage and gcp or or, or the blob storage in azure um, however it still makes sense for us to also send another copy of the data to uh, some of the other buddy nodes and in this case we call them subscribers um, because they keep a local cache of the recently written data on their local disk so that we can reduce the amount of times we have to access shared storage and so we we have the file system cache uh, that we call the depot on local disk of each of these nodes and then a buffer pool that's caching the data um, in memory as well so that's a bit about how we changed our design after realizing that having different sort orders for the buddy projections um, uh, didn't, didn't work well for our customers who are storing large fact tables. Um, there have also been a lot of changes to the hardware that Vertica runs on. Yeah. When Vertica was, was uh, first GA'd, we were running on local disk. Now, as I said, we're, we're running on shared storage and caching on local disk. Uh, all of our customers in the early days were running on bare metal. We didn't support anything else at that time. And now our new customers are more likely to run in a virtualized environment, either a public or private cloud or VM of some sort than they are on bare metal. CPUs, the cores, the, the frequencies are no longer getting faster. Uh, in some instances, beefy machines have slower cores, but they have more of them on a die. Uh, so that the overall compute power is increasing, but the performance, the clock speed of an individual core isn't increasing. So we've had to change our scheduling and our threading model that we use within our execution engine. And networking, either because of hardware can changes or about, because of... Yep. Sorry, can, you, can you talk a little bit about the, what, like, what the threading, sorry, what the scheduling changes you guys made? Yes, so we used to depend on the OS thread scheduler and we would create a number of threads that were roughly equal to the number of cores on the box for each of the plans that we were executing. And then we would depend on that to give us reasonably good parallelism for that query execution. And now because the number of cores is significantly greater, right? That, and at, at that time there would be eight, 16, maybe 32 cores on a box. And now we're seeing uh, machines with significantly more cores on the box. And so we're more careful about how we do our thread scheduling. We now handle it within the software instead of depending on the OS. I guess, did you originally depend on the OS because Vertica started off as a fork of Postgres and that's what Postgres does? Or at, by, at that point, before you did this major rewrite, you guys have already removed all that sort of that process Worker per, worker per process approach that Postgres was doing. Yes, yeah, the worker per, per process approach that Postgres was doing and their use of global memory because they were running in separate processes was a significant um, headache for the early engineers of Vertica to work around. But this is this is different. We had already, our execution engine had already worked around that. Um, but we were depending heavily on the operating system thread scheduler and uh, as the number of, th of threads that we were running increased, we then created a, uh, a process queue and our own thread scheduler. And that also gives us more control over prioritization and some other things. You know, we, we've played some games with nicing threads and depending on the operating system scheduler um, to give us the behavior that we wanted, but it, it never really gave us the behavior that we wanted. Um, you know, the, 
lots of different reasons for that. Some of the pro commands that, or the operations that you run are uh, exclusive per process, you know, memory mapping and so forth. Um, and you know, just lacked that fine-grained control over prioritization of threads. Thank you. And so the other significant change has been with the network layer. Networking has gotten uh, faster relative to CPU than it was previously. You used to be able to depend on network being a bottleneck, and now that's not always the case. Um, and so there was a need to look at the way that we're doing sort, and in particular, the way that we're doing key comparisons in order to adjust to the changing landscape of the hardware and make our query execution faster. So sort is important. Um, as I described, we use it in our data target when we're uh, writing out these ROS files. Um, it's also important when we're doing uh, query optimizations like a group by pipe or a pipeline join where we can use the sort order of the projection in order to do the join or the group by efficiently. Um, and especially if you want to do those operations across multiple threads. Uh, and I'm sure that most of you are aware of, you know, when you're doing an optimization, you don't have to worry about the sort order. It tends to be significantly easier to parallelize than if you have to maintain sort order and do the parallelization. So we end up doing a lot of things where we take sorted streams, we segment them, do the operations like partial group buys, then we bring those streams back together, maintaining the sort order, doing something like a tournament um, sort so that we can do them in multiple threads and uh, get high throughput. Right. So we asked ourselves, could we do the sort faster? And in particular, the comparison, we, we compared ourselves to Tencent's Indian Daytona, and that was faster than what Vertica was doing. So we decided that, yes, we can do sort faster and set about uh, achieving that. Um, a little bit of background. So data that's transferred, transferred between operators within our execution engine. Um, so operators being things like group by, uh, join, um, uh, resegment of the data and so forth. Um, when we move that data between those operators, they're stored in blocks that are either row or column major, but you can uh, pick out individual cells within those blocks. Um, they're they're uh, self-maintained. So you might have a block of timestamps that we can then vectorize and send through uh, an expression that might apply a date difference to each of the cells within that block. Um, and having that column oriented makes that expression an evaluation very efficient and vectorizing it uh, so that we can get a bunch of operations within a single virtual method call. So in order to do a comparison between each of the values within the key that we're comparing on or that we're sorting by, we have to consider the type of each of the column, the, dis the descending or ascending specification the null ordering, whether null, nulls come first or last within the ordering, and then some other uh, pieces of, of content that are important for finding the values within those blocks, like the location of the first row, the stride between each of the columns, the number of rows, and so forth. But those first three that are in bold, those are inspections that have to be done for each comparison that's made. And so with our fifth version of our execution engine, uh, one of the, uh, this being one of the design changes that we were making, um, we looked at how we could do the encoding differently so that we could do a word by word comparison with no access to metadata uh, in order to speed the sort, uh, speed the comparisons that we're doing. Um, and you know, could we push all the logic to do the comparisons correctly to an encoding on the keys. And so the goal was to have a comparison algorithm that looked just like this simple bit of code. And in fact, this is actually the compare, this is the exact code. This isn't a snippet or a summary of the code. This is the exact code for the comparison that we're doing. 
uh, within our execution engine. So that works fine for integers that can be packed into words easily enough. But how do you make it work for variable length values? You know, for example, if you had these two tuples where the first column in the sort order had close followed by the second column in the sort order, but not the close, but not the same. And then the second tuple that had as the first column in the sort order close, but and then as the second column, not the same. How do you differentiate between these two tuples if you're going to glom them together into a contiguous words? You're asking like, like how, how to do like a fuzzy matching? Or like, what, are you, like, what are you asking? Sorry. It, it's going to be an absolute comparison. So in this case, what's on the left-hand side would come out first in the sort order because the column that contains close would sort lower than close but. Oh, sorry. Sorry, that. I mean, like the, the close but not the same, but close but not the same. That, that that's the that's the two we that's the example data. Sorry. Yes. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. I, so the the first column contains close and the second one, but not the same. And then in the second tuple, you have close but, and then the second column not the same, right? And you want to glom these into one contiguous array of words that you can do a fast comparison on. Um, so ignoring what we're doing to the first byte in the word, right, where we're applying this XOR in order to make it compare relative to the null values, which we'll talk about in just a second. The solution is that for a variable length word, you store each of the bytes within the word with, and at the very end, you store the number of bytes contained in the word plus one if the value continues on to the next word. So this allows us to do a word by word comparison of all of the variable length values, possibly sp spanning multiple columns and compare it with that very simple algorithm that I showed earlier, which is just a simple for loop with very little branching involved. Right. And so the key here is that we're doing an encoding to the keys that are going to be compared in order to come up with words that we can compare that we can compare each word in the array to determine whether the value sorts before or after the other. So null values, if it's null first, which is our default, then the null value is the minimum integer value. An empty string would become one greater than that. And then we'd apply the logic that I described before, where we XOR the first value and then store each of the bytes, subsequent bytes in the word, with the last byte being the number of bytes in the word plus one if it continues on to the next word. By encoding the values prior to doing the comparisons, because we're going to do many more comparisons than we're going to do uh, than just one, um, we saw a significant performance improvement. In this chart, higher is better because we're looking at the number of gigabytes per second per socket that can be sorted. And as I said previously, before we undertook this redesign, Vertigo was slower than both Tencent Daytona and Indy. Uh, after doing the encoding trick and applying the simple comparison algorithm that I that I showed, Vertica became significantly faster.
and this is on a, a single node comparison um, between an early implementation of this EE5 encoding and one that was done um, as recently as this year. So that has an impact not just on sorting data to store it in the ROS format as the data target does, but also when we're applying a group by algorithm, um, specifically when there are a significant number of uh, distinct values in the group by. So the X axis has number of distinct values and the Y axis has amount of time. So in this case, lower is smaller bars are better. As the number of distinct values increases, the performance benefits that we get over using this encoding to do the comparisons increases as well. And that's particularly important because if you have a small number of distinct values, then a group by hash will work just fine. You're not gonna have to worry about spilling to disk, but when you have large numbers of distinct values, you prefer to run it through a group by pipe and avoid um, having to spill to disk. Any questions on the, the encoding and the sort comparison that we're doing? Good. All right. Yeah, can I ask you a question quick? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So how do you handle when you have multiple like count distinct, like count distinct A, comma count distinct B, comma count distinct C, which data science guys do quite a bit. <laughs> they may have like 50 of them in there. Yes. So and this is remember you do partial and you final. So you have to remember a bunch of stuff in order to dedupe. Partial. And then you do yeah, you do partial group by, okay, yes. different nodes. But then when you want to do final group by, you have to dedupe the columns again because the count is stink, not just count. You have to carry the information. Yes. Yes. So you're describing a situation where you are grouping by the same set of keys and then applying a count distinct. So you might group by ticker symbol, but then count the distinct bid and the distinct ask prices. Is that correct? Yeah, that is your group by column, group by column, then you're distinct on other things. Right, right. And so what you're applying then is you're doing a uh, grouping based on, you know, in this case, if we're talking about a group by pipe, you'd be grouping based on the grouping keys, uh, which gave the example of symbol. And then you'd be applying a similar um, grouping to the secondary key, which would be the bid and the ask price. So you have yeah, the, but there are the, many secondary keys, right? You there are you. many secondary keys, yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. And they're and so, independent you know, of each other. Right, right. And so the, the simple thing to do is to separate those and treat them as separate subqueries. And that, of course, is expensive because you've got to reapply that primary grouping based on the group by key. The more efficient thing to do is to do the primary grouping and then apply multiple secondary sorts to the uh, keys that you're counting. Right. And so yeah, but you, the problem got... is that you may have a huge common sub expression across them because you are creating your common sub expression before grouping, which is terrible. <laughs> common sub expression before Yeah, grouping. because I do the join, then I have to do group mm -hmm. by uh, like the stock symbol and column a common this common distinct of a, and then I do another one for you know symbol and column distinct of B and so on and so forth. So the, the result of the join has to be fed to all of these guys. So unless you have some push mechanism, 
other than that, then you have to temp it and then read from the tempo. That's disastrous because it's before the group. Yes. Anyway, we can we can yeah. do <laughs> I, 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 Stephen, I, I can I can introduce you to Hamid at first if you want. He's at IBM Research. Yeah, that sounds sounds good. I'd, li I'd like to dig into that more. Yeah. Thanks, Hamid. All right. Um, so switching gears a little bit and talking about uh, the elasticity of Vertica running in the cloud. Um, I'll give you a second to peruse the cartoon. And I will mention that Vertica does now support running in Kubernetes as well as on uh, all of the major cloud vendors. Um, so a couple of use cases that we've seen from our customers over the years for uh, why having elasticity, uh, which is uh, akin to, to running in the cloud, either public or private, was important to them. Um, some of them have a, a bursty workload. One example of that is a follow the sun model, where your workers in uh, Asia are busy at different hours than your workers on the west coast of the United States. Um, and so you want to move resources around in order to accommodate those data analysts in the places where their uh, where, where their their sun is up. Um, another is that customers uh, didn't want to throw data away; they wanted to keep it around forever, and so they had a very long tail of historical data. But they would are typically querying the most recent data in the database, uh, so they want their compute to be independent of the amount of storage that they have. Uh, you know, they might be querying this month's data, um, but they've kept data around for many decades. The, another reason that is very straightforward is if everything else is in the cloud. If you've put your other applications there so that they can be scalable, then uh, you want your database to be close to those applications. And so you want your database to be in the cloud as well. Um, and another very pragmatic reason is that justifying OpEx is often easier than justifying CapEx, especially when the difference between them can be significant. If you want to run an experiment, do a Skunk Works project or a hackathon project in the cloud, it's easier to get approval for spending several thousand dollars over a couple of months than it is to get approval for spending hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars on hardware just for uh, an experiment. Um, so keeping in mind some of Vertica's core design principles, especially those for MPP scale out and distributed query, I mentioned before that Vertica is careful about how we place the data so that we can do co-segmented joins, co-segmented group buys. Uh, don't have to utilize the network to resegment data among the nodes in the database if we've stored it in a way that the grouping or the joining can be done uh, independently on the node. So here's an example where if I create a projection for my customer's table and I segment the projection by the hash of an ID on all nodes, um, and then I create another projection for my purchases table and I segment by the corresponding customer ID key, now, when I do a join between those two tables, there's no need to shuffle the data between the two nodes because I'm joining on the keys that I've segmented the data by. I can, I can do the join um, local on each of the nodes and then uh, process the results and send them back to the initiator. So that makes that careful placement of the data makes elasticity challenging. In our Eon mode uh, architecture, instead of calling it segments, we call it shards. Um, but the design is that nodes are assigned to shards. And though the data is stored in shared storage, the shard that they're responsible for processing is determined by the subscription. And the one and the shard that they're storing in that local cache that we call the depot is also determined by that uh, shard subscription. So if we started off with three nodes and we had three shards to begin with, 
then each time a query is executed, all three of those nodes are participating in it. If we double the size of our cluster, then we have a challenge because we've only got these three shards, but now we have six nodes that can do compute on top of those shards. All right. For new data, the solution is relatively easy. For new data, we can just write it down um, so that we segment the data in a way that's, uh, that's optimized for the number of compute nodes that we have. Um, if we were to take away three of those nodes, then we'd have an assignment where for the new data, each node would be associated with two of the shards, 1A and 1B. Um, the older data, it's a little bit trickier. That's already been written out. It's already contained in storage containers that uh, group things together based on that segmentation. So we have two ways of dealing with what we call elastic crunch scaling, which is when we're going to apply multiple nodes to the same uh, storage containers. One is that if we don't care about the segmentation, then we, or sorry, this is the other case. When we do care about the segmentation, then we can have those two nodes. So in this case, one and two that are reading from shard one, they can apply a filter where they're reading just half of the segments worth of data, right? So they're both doing the same amount of IO, uh, but they're applying a filter so that they're doing compute on only half of the data. And this works well for compute intensive tasks. Obviously, it doesn't provide a significant win for anything that's IO intensive. The other approach that we can take is that we've stored this data in multiple storage containers. If we don't care about the segmentation of the data or if it's very IO intensive, then we can separate those storage containers and distribute them reasonably uniformly to each of the nodes. So that nodes one and two in this instance are reading from different storage containers. They have the same segments that they're processing. And so if we care about a co-segmented group by, we'll have to resegment the data between the two of them. Um, but this works well for workloads that are IO intensive. Any questions on those two different approaches? Good. All right. All right. And I think that was all the material I had prepared for this talk. So there's, uh, you can, I'm sure you're probably already aware, you can go and learn more at vertica.com. Um, you can try it for free. Uh, that link takes you to our Vertic Accelerator, which is our as a service offering, um, which is easy to spin up and get going with. And then of course, we're always hiring. So you can find job listings at vertica.com slash careers. Steve, I will, I will applaud on behalf of everyone else. Um, so let's open up to the audience. So Matt, what do you wanna go first? Yeah, thanks, Stephen, for the talk. Uh, just a quick question. So when you um, talk about these cloud deployments, are these nodes typically homogeneous or do you see a mix of instance sizes within a single uh, deployment? Yeah, I'm really glad you asked that. That's a great question. Uh, so we have this notion of a cluster, which is the entire database. And then within a cluster, we have subclusters, which are specific for different workloads. So you might have a subcluster for doing your ETL jobs, and maybe that has to be, be big and beefy, so you have 64 nodes in that. Um, for your ad hoc queries, maybe you don't care as much about the performance, so you have 16 nodes in that subcluster. For your dashboarding queries, you might have many of those subclusters for dashboarding that have relatively few nodes, maybe four or eight nodes in each of those. Within a single subcluster, the nodes should be homogeneous because they're doing work together, right? And, and you're only gonna be as fast as your slowest member of that subcluster. So those should be homogeneous. Between subclusters though, they can be heterogeneous. So that big beefy ETL job that you have to run, you know, maybe those 64 nodes are, are, are big, expensive, powerful machines. Um, you know, maybe for the ad hoc query or for your machine learning workload, uh, you have, you, where, you know, time might not be as important. You have less beefy machines. Does that does that make sense? Yep, perfect. Thank you. 
Yeah, it's a great question. I'm, I'm glad you asked that. All right, let me go for it. Okay, I actually have two questions. So one is the follow-up to the previous question. So when you have different subclusters, do you also cache the data independently? Yes, the data is cached independently, and that's a, a great question because the query workload might look very different across each of those. Yeah, okay, good, makes sense. So the other question I have is that have you compared with the cloud native engines uh, such as Dremio, how close they are to you? Because they're all chasing you anyway. I mean, chasing the classic databases. So how close are they? I would say also too that uh, the, database, the database guys announced last week they have, they have, they hold the TPCH record. Yeah. Okay. Here. Yeah. 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 Um, Dremio, we we haven't done comparisons with recently. Um, I mean, uh, mainly because we we don't see them very often in our field when we're doing proof, proofs of concepts. We've done some comparisons with other cloud native databases, uh, Snowflake relatively recently, where we showed that we had, especially when it came to throughput, significant advantage in, in performance, um, and uh, especially in cost per performance. OK, so that was a price performance comparison, or just the pure throughput comparison? It, it had both elements in it. Um, what we found is that when uh, scaling up the number of concurrent queries, that the performance in in uh, Vertica was significantly better. So, how big of a database did you have over there? If you can talk about it, this was done by a third party contractor. I can look for the uh, if you look for search for Mignite and Vertica, you'll probably find the comparison that I'm speaking of. Yeah. Or if you go to, to Vertica's website, uh, I believe there's a link for downloading that as well. OK. All right, any, any other questions from the audience? I'll, I'll ask one more. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how the, how the catalogs are stored, like how things have changed from obviously Postgres, what, 15 years ago or something like that. But like, have you moved to a different database system entirely? Like I've seen like foundation DB used for some systems to store their catalogs or is everything in house? Everything's in house. Um, the catalog has several really neat properties to it. Um, it also has a couple of pain points. It's uh, relatively bloated. Um, it uh, is. That's everyone's catalog. Yeah. Um, and uh, but it does have some some great properties of uh, consistency guarantees. It's it's really interesting, uh, particularly when you know distributed queries. Right, we have this mechanism for reference counting the catalog keeping versions around because uh, my query that I initiated might be running on a different version of the query than your or different version of the catalog than the query that you initiated just a fraction of a of a second later. Um, and what's more, each of the nodes, their catalogs are advancing at a different rate than are perceived by the query, if that makes sense. So when I initiate my query, I'm looking at a catalog version. But now when it gets distributed to the other nodes in the database, they have a different version of the catalog, right? And so you know, we, we need to, to make sure that there's consistency and that everybody has at least the same version as my initiator, right? So there's, there's a lot of interesting stuff going on um, in terms of the catalog in, the, in a Vertica database. Well, thanks. My last question would be, um, have you guys noticed any sort of major trends or changes in how people are using Vertica now that the cloud service versus when it was on-prem? I mean, this is hard to know because you don't, you don't have the visibility to see how people are using on-prem Vertica as much as you, you do in the cloud. But it, so I'm asking, is there any high level things like, oh, people do, you know, their queries are shorter, their queries are longer, like, like any, any sort of major trend like that? 
Um, or is, or maybe, are question. people stupid? So, or, are people dumber on the cloud, right? Because because to get through the process of running Vertigo on prem, you had to go through procurement and and talk to people who knew what they were doing. Whereas now you just give Vertigo your credit card and you're up and running. Well, it, it it's definitely um, you know one of our challenges to offer excellent performance that's also easy to administer. You know, the, the, um, and I, I I don't know that that's uh, unique to the cloud because those valuable uh, DBA expertise those are those are those are limited. Um, and and so you know, and and it's not always the um, DBA who's optimizing performance of the database. Uh, you know, application developers are creating tables and projections and um, and so forth. And and so that's been one of the challenges is both identifying instances where a projection could be rewritten to be optimized for the query workload that is. It, that's being run against the database um, and also making it easier for those optimizations to be applied because you know we, we no longer in the early days you had a, you know somebody that was working with sales engineers at Vertica or somebody who was an expert on the Vertica system they'd learn how to optimize projections for the workload and you know they'd uh, curate their Vertica database and and now um, you know they're Many of our customers have a lot of different users on the database who don't have that Vertica expertise. Yeah, or maybe another the question might be like, is there a sort of SQL functionality or feature that you guys did not think was a high priority when it's on prem, but now that you have observability to every query ever executed on the cloud, you you realize that it is something you guys need to optimize. Uh, so, so we don't our our cloud deployment model is a little bit different. It's that we deploy uh, within the customer's own cloud account. Um, right. So we are able to it, administer it, the it database. We can't see some of the queries, but we're not we're not observing. Yeah. Got it. Okay. All right. Fair.